Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bible Thumper podcast. My name is Patrick Hayes, and with me is my co-host, Caleb Jenks, coming to you from Rosebud, Texas. And tonight, we are talking about the topic, women dressing modestly. So you might be thinking to yourself, uh, wow, I have never heard anyone talk about this. And we've actually talked about that. Why is this topic not taught more often? And uh, we all have our thoughts. Um, Caleb and I both asked our wives to join us on this one, and um, we got a little bit of an eye roll. Uh, They weren't real excited about getting on. So that left Caleb and I, two guys, to talk about the Bible and tell all the women what the Bible says about how they should be dressing. So... Our wives can get on here next week and tell us everything that we said wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I've been excited to get to this topic. Now, um, I had no idea how scared of women Caleb is because he is clearly a liberal who does not want to talk about what the Bible says concerning this topic. And he made that known to me. So I'm, I'm guessing... I'm going to be thrown under the bus all over the place and have my legs cut right out from under me during this next hour. We'll see. We'll see if I'm a prophet or not. Did I just tell them predict the future? Uh, but with that being said, <clears throat> believe it or not, this topic was brought to us by one of our uh, loyal followers who, you know, it'd be nice if she showed up and supported us in, in this hour. Uh, no one seems to be on just yet. But hey, we, got, <clears throat> we got five. We got five people. Okay, yeah. that's exciting. So uh, Caleb and I have always said that we'll tackle any topic that's in the Bible. You know, we're not scared to do so. And to be honest with you, I don't know why people are scared to talk about this. The Bible has a lot to say about it. And that's what we're going to get into. We're going to have a lot of Bible verses and uh, we're going to see where we go. So, Caleb, do you have any place you want to start with or do you want me to just uh, jump in and start taking fire here? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I was, um, I was actually just thinking about this uh, about 20 minutes ago. Mm-hmm. We were at a service, uh, uh, kind of a church service, outdoor prayer service. It involved people from many different churches, and I was, I was thinking, um, thank God that there are Christians out there that have some sort of a standard of mm-hmm. dress and modesty, because it is really hard to be a Christian and to worship God and to be in the setting of church when people are not dressed somewhat appropriately. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just thought it actually is, it is an appropriate, um, it is an appropriate thing to talk about as Christians, even though it's not a comfortable thing for us to talk about, it is necessary. And obvious, uh, obviously uh, this was put on here as a title of, of how, how should women dress. There's obviously things that apply to men as well, but more so to women naturally, just because, of the way that God created us um, and the fact that women are, are beautiful and attractive and um, Patrick and I are not. So, so um, I just thought I would put that out there to start with that. This really does apply to everyone, even though we are addressing women and that's the title on here is how should, you know, women dressing modestly, but it's not that we're just here to gang up on the women. This is really, this is really an issue that is paramount to actually being able to function properly in the, in the Christian church. I mean, you can't really show up and and function properly without some sort of standard. So where do you draw that standard and where is that line drawn? And so I guess we can get into some of that. Yeah. And honestly, Caleb, I have quite a bit in here that covers, you know, the way men and women are supposed to look. And and you need to talk about both because God compares the two and says, "Okay, guys, you're not supposed to look like them. And ladies, you're not supposed to look like them. Uh, But you asked a good question, Caleb, which is, you know, uh, we all have to have some standards. So where do we draw the line? Okay, that's where I draw the line. Okay, so what this book says is what God wants, and that's what we're going to try to stick to. What about people that tell you, though, that the Bible doesn't ever tell you how to dress, how to look, and we can we have the freedom as Christians to dress however we want? Okay, and so they read the same Bible. Sure. Well, first off, if they say the Bible doesn't say anything about how you should dress, I would say they've never read their Bible because it says a lot about it, and and we're going to get into all of that. But you're really you're really playing the uh, liberty in Christ card. Uh, really, really hard. And the problem is the logical conclusion that you will end up at is that 
um, attire is neutral. You can wear whatever you want. It doesn't matter. God Christian doesn't streaking. care. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Now that's obviously an extreme example and a ridiculous one, but the point is attire is not neutral. Every single person has a dress code, either by design, meaning you chose what you're going to wear with purpose. And that is based on moral and philosophical standards. Or you have a dress code by default, meaning you allowed others to do the thinking for you and you have accepted their conclusions. And what I'm afraid of is that the majority of women in Christianity in America today have a standard of dress by default. They have looked at the world, they have looked at what other women do in the church, and they said, that's a good enough standard for me, I'll take that. And that's not the that, attitude that's actually, any of us wanna have. But that's, that anything. is a that is a good theory though. If we go down the whole moral relativism thing, then it just, it sorts everything out. You just kind of average out with everybody else and you can throw the Bible away. And unfortunately, what people usually do is they look at what the world's doing and they try to stay an arm's length away from what the world is doing. The problem is the world standard is moving and it's moving downhill and it's moving downhill quickly. And if you just look at the standards in America over the last hundred years, and obviously we're talking about what you wear, your attire, but you can pick whatever... Um, uh, whatever you want to measure. And you can see that the world standard in America has gone downhill and it's done that quickly. So therefore, if the Christian's standard is an arm's length away from the world, then the problem is the church is going to be where the world was 10 years ago. And then that means that the church is going to be worse off than the world was 30 years ago. So we cannot make our standard based on the world. We have to make our standard based on the word of God. Okay, <clears throat> so the real debate is over standards of dress. Uh, <clears throat> it's between God as the lawgiver or man as the lawgiver. So let me ask you this, Caleb. <clears throat> Who gets to make the rules? In your life, Caleb, do you get to make the rules? Not as Christian, nope. Okay. I'm not my own. I've been bought with the price. I agree. Okay, I don't get to uh, make the decisions. Uh, God gets to make the decisions yep. and I get to argue about them, but hopefully uh, I will submit to his will. So as soon as the Christian settles that first point in their heart that we are going to take the word of God, we're going to take the scriptures and we're going to do what God says, then it's really not much of a debate. And it's very, it's comforting to find that God has standards and when I accept God's standards as the best thing for me, then I find safety and security and comfort in that. But when I don't trust God and I don't believe that God has the right to tell me what to do, well, then all of a sudden I start to have a bad attitude whenever I come by any portions of scripture that say, thus saith the Lord. And, you know, the problem Wait, is you, you could have a bad attitude. <laughs> You know, the problem is the Bible says a lot about every subject. Okay, so I wanted to go over something, and if I could, I'm just going to kind of jump in here, and I'm going to go over a little bit of the Bible, and you just stop me or ask a question or correct me or, or, or jump in with any comments that you have as we go. I'll so, try to leave sarcasm to a minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've got, I got enough we'll crap in the first 11 minutes here. Okay, so <clears throat> God is the originator and the designer of clothing. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 7, we see that God actually gives out clothes. There are four times in the Bible where God expressly, um, we'll say, designs clothing. And we find out that all four of these examples are the same. So the first one is when God gives out clothes, and that's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And we read, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So this is after the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, after Eve ate of the fruit of the tree and then gave to her husband, and he ate, and they had both fallen into sin and were now in a fallen state, and 
uh, what they did was they tried to make their own clothes and they used fig leaves and they sewed aprons is the word the Bible is the word that the Bible uses. Okay, so then in verse 21, we find and on to, well, so obviously the aprons did not do. God was not satisfied with that. So God makes them clothes. So on to Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them? So after God doled out the punishments for disobedience to Eve, to Adam, to the serpent, he appropriately clothed Adam and Eve. The aprons failed to adequately cover them. So God made clothes. And the coats God made were the same we see later on in the Bible when God deals with clothing again. So although we don't have a picture of what God made for Adam and Eve in the Bible, we know that coats went down to the ankle and had long sleeves to their wrists. In the case of a man doing physical labor, okay, they would wear one that was just below the knee and sometimes without sleeves. And you would find out that soldiers would go into battle with similar attire. But we should also understand that this covering was meant to represent covering their sin. And that's something people often fail to realize when we're talking about this clothing, it doubled as a representation, a prophetic one of the covering of their sin. So what it, a lot of people don't realize, when was the first death in the Bible? It wasn't when Cain slew Abel. It was when God killed an animal and used its skin to make clothing for Adam and Eve. That was the first death in the Bible. And that was a representation that death was required. Blood was required to cover sin. So when God showed them this, and covered their sin, he didn't do it with a tiny little fur bikini, okay? Adam and Eve tried to make aprons out of the fig leaves, and an apron, as we know, only covers part of you. God made coats of skin to cover them, which, as I said before, is a representation of salvation that we see later on in the New Testament. Okay, so the second time that we see God dealing with clothing in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 28, and this is when God institutes the priesthood. So Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt. We have the 10 plagues. They cross through the Red Sea. They go to Mount Sinai in Arabia. They get the uh, 10 commandments and a whole bunch of other laws. And now we have a priesthood and the priests are given clothing to wear. So in Exodus 28, verses 3 and 4, we read, And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a broidered coat, a mitre, a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, without going into you know, a great amount of detail here, uh, the priests were covered just as Adam and Eve were from their neck, as you would be with, say, a t-shirt down to their ankles and to their wrists. So again, we see that they were completely covered. Now, I do want to stop here and I want to make a quick point that I am not saying that that is the standard that Christians need to have. I'm not saying that you can't have a t-shirt because it's not long sleeved down to the wrist. But the Bible is showing us that this was God's standard, at least in the times when his people were coming to worship him. That is, I think, stated without much wiggle room. Okay, so I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to say that you can't wear a t-shirt. You know, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. I don't think that God never says that that's the standard for every Christian, but we cannot deny that the four times God designs clothes. Okay. This is the way he does it. Okay. So the third time is when God wears clothes. So what did God wear when he was on earth? And obviously here we're talking about Jesus. So we know more about what Christ wore really than any of these other examples. Uh, we know exactly what the Jews wore at the time of Christ. So the Jews wore an undergarment called a haluk, also called a katuna, 
uh, it went down to the feet and it went up to the neck again, like a t-shirt. And that was covered up by the outer garment called the talith. So these garments were required for anyone who would publicly read the scriptures or exercise any function in the synagogue. So when God himself came in the flesh, he covered himself the same way that he had covered Adam and Eve and the Levitical priesthood. And like I said, this we know from history, this we know from Jewish history, this is no secret at all. So we see that God was consistent in the first three times. Now, the fourth one we haven't seen yet, but it's prophesied. The fourth time when God gives the saints in heaven clothes. So in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, we read, Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. And then in Revelation 7, 9, we read, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. So <clears throat> this is a loose outer garment for men extending down to the feet. It was worn by kings, by priests, and by any person of rank. Uh, it appears that the Bible offers us a standard for covering the body, regardless of how any of us feel about that. Uh, we will all be wearing one of these robes one day if we're saved. Um, <clears throat> so the Old and the New Testaments reveal that the earthly and heavenly people of God wore garments that covered them from the neck to uh, at least below the knee, certainly arguably to the calf or all the way down to the ankle. So <clears throat> when we believers do not have black and white commands in the Bible, our normal practice is to search God's word for a principle from which we may draw a conclusion. If we reject this practice, then the question comes up, where do we find our standard for modesty? So if we don't use the portions of scripture that are written out explaining <clears throat> what the men and women of God wore, then what do we use to figure it out? So <clears throat> that's kind of the introduction, okay? God designed clothes four times. Those are the four examples. We gave you the verses. You can look them up on your own. So <clears throat> if anything, we at least have to agree that whatever they all wore had to fall under the term modest apparel. And the reason is that we find that term used in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So if ladies are to be modest, they will not draw attention to themselves in the wrong way. Their attire will not say sex or pride or money, but rather purity, humility, and moderation. So it should go without saying that the attire of a godly woman must differ from a pagan woman, from a uh, non-saved woman, from worldly women, and from women who are disobedient to God. So because God gives a standard, that means there's a right and a wrong side of that standard. Okay, jump in. I gave you a lot to chew on. <laughs> yeah well now's the part where we've already discussed you have to get covered up so now you have to make this relevant and figure out how we can like bring back in the shorts and the tank tops and you know make all this to where you know there you wouldn't go. want to be too too literal here and have people like feeling like they actually had to clothe themselves <laughs> um no so you brought up something interesting there so it says for women to be shamefaced um mm -hmm. or shamefacedness which yeah. uh, i've i run a, i ran across that some time back and I thought something that was interesting about that was, and I'm not usually one to go back to the Greek and study the original meeting and try to try to complicate stuff. I'd rather just take things at face value. 
-hmm. but it's interesting that being that we're supposed to as christians have the joy of the lord and and um so we're supposed to be happy and you know whatever that that women should be shamefaced in church and so i looked mm -hmm. it up and as it was translated from the greek the the original would have meant to be reverent um, or similar to what they would have had like in a at a funeral and i thought that was interesting and and this part um, this part of timothy here is definitely talking about um, believers in the church this isn't just talking about as you walk down the street or in your home he was specifically addressing how believers are supposed to act in the church not that that means we shouldn't dress modestly out of the church but if you look at at the way that you would have reverence for someone who died. And this is just something that, that was interesting to me because I tend to dress. Oftentimes I show up to church in jeans and, you know, kind of casual attire. But if I go to a funeral, I'm going to dress respectfully for the, the presence or the lack thereof of the dead person that's getting buried. Okay. So not to make a joke of this, but if you think about that, all of us would have some respect going to somebody's funeral. But yeah, when mm -hmm. we go to church, um, when it turns into a fashion show, basically, see how revealing we can be, how fancy we can have our hair, how how nice we can have our clothes, um, and how much attention we can draw to ourselves. It is obvious that if we were to be reverent toward God, that we wouldn't be turning church into a fashion show, which is what it oftentimes becomes. It definitely becomes a fashion show oftentimes. So what you made mention of there is actually really good because Peter hits this as well. So <clears throat> uh, Timothy talks about and very clearly makes the sta statement that the apparel of women ought to be modest. So <clears throat> it says their hair should not be broidered, broidered. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's fine. You've never heard the word because you're not using a King James Bible. It's not braided. Many, many um, uh, other Bibles say that women should not have braided hair. That's not true. The Bible is not condemning women from braiding their hair. It's not forbidding you from braiding your hair. It's supposed to be broided, B-R-O-I-D-E-D. -E so <clears throat> it's not supposed to be full of gold and pearls. And Peter mentions this in chapter three of his first letter. He says, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. So this, this refers to popular hairstyles of the day in which women uh, piled their hair in a lavish set of braids interwoven with expensive jewelry uh, in an attempt to proclaim their wealth and their station in society. So it was, you know, one of their ways that they would show up all the other women who were not as rich as they were. And that's what thank Timothy you. is making mention of in, in the end of that verse. Yeah. Thank God that that isn't happening now because now you'd have to braid toilet paper into your hair in order to show your, your wealth and standing in society. <laughs> toilet so, paper and hand sanitizer. <laughs> okay. So now I want to get into something and okay. I'm going to jump into something here that's going to lead us down a rabbit trail. And let me know if you want to if you want to rein me back in and get back on subject. So one of the things that the Bible talks about a lot and we're going to see here <clears throat> is that men and women are supposed to look different. Now, <clears throat> when we go through the Bible, one thing that I notice is that the Bible for the men talks a lot about beards. So. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a couple verses here and just explain this and, and, and bear with me, give me a little bit of latitude and, and I'll, and I'll get to my point here as quickly as I can. So in Leviticus chapter nine, verse 27, we read, you shall not round the corners of your heads, neither thou sh uh, shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So God was giving uh, the, um, uh, the law to Moses. And he, he explained the way that you're supposed to wear your beard. Now, Without getting into the specifics of that, and I'll be happy to explain that whole thing, but I'm going to try to keep moving for time. The point I want to make is that God was explaining to the Israelites the way they were supposed to wear their beards, which means there is an incorrect way that you wear your beards. The pagans did this very differently, and as always, God, God wants his people to stand out as different. So <clears throat> if nothing else, we can say that in order for that verse to be relevant, that would mean that 
the guys had what? Well, they had to have beards. Otherwise, what's the point of telling them how to wear it? Again, in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, this is one of the more famous passages, along with Isaiah chapter 53, talking about Christ and what he went through when he went to the cross and some of the, the brutal treatment that he received. It says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. A lot of people don't understand that during the period where they put the crown of thorns on him and they were beating him and spitting on him and mocking him, they also ripped out his beard. And to explain to someone how terribly painful that is, I don't think, you know, you'd probably be able to realize unless you grabbed a handful of your hair and ripped it out or ripped out a piece of your beard. Um, but this is something that Jesus went through. And this also will help you understand why some people after he rose from the dead did not recognize him right away. Okay. Cause his beard was plucked out. Um, but again, it's telling us that Jesus had a beard. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, because guess who doesn't have beards? Hey, women don't have beards. Do you know what that helps us do? That helps us to identify men and women from a good ways off. Okay. On top of that, the Bible talks about haircuts and the Bible explains <clears throat> that doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Do you know that men are supposed to have short hair? A lot of people don't like that. And I hate to tell you, but that means that almost every picture you've ever seen of Jesus is wrong. He did not have long hair. Why not? Because the Bible says it's a shame for men to have long hair. So Jesus did not. So all of those effeminate, you know, paintings of that look like Jesus being a white woman, you can just throw them out. They're nonsense. They're garbage. He was Jewish. He looked Middle Eastern. He had short hair and he had a beard and he was a man. He was a carpenter. OK, <clears throat> along with that, you find out <clears throat> in Revelation chapter nine, verses seven and eight. And I and actually I, I skipped a part, OK, because I went right to beards and that men are supposed to have short hair. Guess what the Bible talks about women having, Caleb? OK, <clears throat> in first Corinthians 14 and 15. OK, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. So it's a glory for a woman to have long hair. And it's a shame for a man to have long hair. So again, <clears throat> what do we see? From 20 feet away, we can identify men and women. Why? Because men have beards and short hair. Women have long hair. We're supposed to be different. God cares about what we look like. I believe there's a uniform for the Christian. Okay. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. We re now this is uh, this is after the church has been raptured and God is pouring out his judgment upon the Jews and the unbelieving world. And this is when the fifth angel comes and he has the key to the bottomless pit and he opens it up and and out of the pit comes smoke and out of the smoke come locust. OK, so that's that's the idea here in Revelation uh, chapter nine. We read and the shapes of the locust were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So once again, the Bible is saying <clears throat> when John is explaining what these locusts look like, he's saying, well, their faces were like the faces of men, but their hair was like the hair of women. Okay. So he's giving a description that everybody is supposed to understand because men didn't have long hair and women didn't have beards. They were, they are different and God made them different on purpose. <clears throat> so. I feel, I'm feeling pretty good about the fact that I got a little beard going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> this would be getting pretty awkward right about now. <laughs> you know, I was wondering if you were going to show up clean shaven tonight. And I mean, that wasn't going to change anything, you know, now it actually would have been funny. Yeah. Now, whether you, you want to, you know, OK, so with without getting getting into the weeds, uh, understand that God cares about what we look like and we're supposed to look different. OK, so can I go on to a couple more verses? Or you want to jump in here? You have any thoughts about what we're going over here? 
No, I, I you're on you're on to something good here. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep following along. Okay, so <clears throat> the next thing that the Bible talks about is nakedness. Now, when the Bible refers to nakedness, it is different than the way you and I think about it. Okay, for for you and I, you know, when we have a child, they are born naked, right? Okay, we get naked when we take a bath. Okay. <clears throat> the Bible has a speak much... for yourself, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the Bible has a much higher standard for the term naked, and it explains this many, many times in the Bible. So the most popular one that most of us are familiar with, because nobody reads the Old Testament, is John chapter 21, verse 7, where Peter is described as being naked while fishing. So in John 21, 7, this is when Peter gets frustrated and he says, I'm going fishing. And he goes back to what he was doing. And then the Lord appears on the shore and they realize that it's Christ. We read, therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter. So John was with him. <clears throat> it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So <clears throat> Peter was not naked in the way that you and I think that he was. Uh, and not, it was not the way that you and I would use the word today. Throughout the Bible, this term was used whenever a man would shed his outer garment and only be wearing his uh, haluk. Okay. <clears throat> So this was something that men would do if they were just around other men and they were working hard, which is what Peter was doing with the other guys that were on the boat. Okay, Peter took off his outer garment. It was a ways off ashore, far enough where they were having trouble making out who it was on the shore. So the idea was it wasn't a situation where he was being inappropriate. He was surrounded by men and they were working. And the assumption is he was hot. OK, but, you know, maybe he jumped in the water and, you know, that's why he was wearing that. But the point the point is biblical nakedness is very different than what we talk about. And, and, and I'm going to get to a good point here, OK, because our standards need to be different from the world. Now, we also see that this standard is given for women in Isaiah chapter uh, 47, verses one through three. When describing the virgin daughter of Babylon in Isaiah 47, nakedness is described as bare legs and uncovering one's thigh. Okay, look up Isaiah 47 verses 1 through 3. It says, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground, there is no throne. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. So the nakedness described in the book of Isaiah would not even be noticed in most Christian churches or your average Christian retreat, a woman showing off their thigh. Nowadays, okay, that verse right there means any men playing basketball in the 70s with those, you know, ABA, you know, basketball shorts that were like, you know, this long, that was biblical nakedness. That was not acceptable to God. God's standard is very different from the world's, and it's supposed to be. So all the pagans in Egypt and in Greece saw this very differently. The slaves and the athletes, they were often publicly naked. So while the naked body was common for the pagans, being without one's outer garment was considered immodest and shameful for God's standard. That's how different God's standard is for dress than the rest of pagan society. Excuse me. So give you another one. What else goes along with nakedness? Demon possession. In Luke chapter eight, verses 26 through 25, 
and I'm just going to read a couple verses. You all know the story. <clears throat> and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Right? The maniac of Gadara. And then when the demons were cast out of him and the people ran to the city and told them what was going on and everyone came out to see what was happening in verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. So I know a lot of people don't like, you know, drawing a uh, doctrine from a, uh, from, a, from a parable or an analogy or a story or an inference. Okay, but what it says is when you're demon-possessed, you're naked, and when you find the Lord, you put clothes on. Okay, go ahead. Jump on in. That's interesting. I uh, was I was not uh, anticipating some of that. I think you – I'm glad you did some research on that. It's, it, it's interesting to see <laughs> – and I was aware of the fact that oftentimes nakedness in the Bible was referring to exposing the undergarment or, you know, d discarding the outer garment, um, which is partly why there was there's places where it talked about not not going up to the altar on steps, lest your nakedness would be exposed on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait, how short were their, you know, their clothes that they were wearing? And then when I did a Bible study on that, I realized that, you know, this was actually not necessarily referencing literal nakedness like what we think of it now. Yep. Um, and so you you brought up a, a really interesting point there, and that is that God seems to have a standard. And mm -hmm. that is not the stance of most men or women in today's society. Um, modesty is whatever I feel comfortable with. That's yeah. oftentimes what I hear. It's like, well, it's Correct. Whatever, whatever I feel comfortable with, I feel modest when I'm wearing, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and somebody else may not feel modest wearing that, but that's up to them. And there is, there is a bit of liberty that we have as Christians that we aren't under the law and that we, and that some, we do have conscience and we are led by the spirit, but to, to, to get to the point that we're going to think that it's just what we feel comfortable with. Um, oftentimes I find Christians that are falling right down the same tracks as the world where really it's just defined by what is legal and what is permissible by our current day standards, which is mm -hmm. by biblical definitions, you know, not anywhere near acceptable, nor would it have been acceptable a hundred years ago in this country. Or, um, you know, we, one of my sisters had this book that she read when I was a kid and it was, I think it was a story in, um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was called long, maybe it was called Longhorns and Short Tales. And there's a story about Crawford, Colorado, I believe either Crawford or Hotchkiss, which isn't far from where Patrick lives. And there was a young lady, and I believe this was in the uh, 40s or 50s, and she put on a short sleeve dress. And her grandmother or her mother told her to go home and get in bed and cover herself up with a blanket. And that was, that was what was not acceptable in society then was short sleeves. And nowadays, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sitting here wearing short sleeves, uh, but it is interesting how our society progresses toward this... Um, immorality and it's a church is just one or two steps behind it like you mentioned earlier we stay at an arm's length behind it so it i don't think it would be safe at all for us to think that we can just draw our draw our doctrine or our standards in modesty off of um, some sort of relationship to the world around us but um i don't know and you probably have another roth you want this to go but um, i wanted to ask what is your thoughts about um the fact that we're making some comparisons to jesus and mm -hmm. what he would have worn in his culture and the fact that mm -hmm. we're in a different culture and the reason sure. i want to bring this up is because oftentimes things in in the bible are disregarded as well that was the culture that was the times that was what was happening then yeah. And no different than we live in America and we eat certain things, we do certain things here. But if you were to go to Africa as a missionary, do you require everyone in Africa that becomes a Christian to dress mm -hmm. like we do or to, you know, eat like we do that type of thing? Or do you adapt? Do you allow them to become a Christian and still embrace their culture? And that's actually a really strong argument for, I believe, what is moral relativism, where we just draw our lines around society that we fit into rather than to realize that actually what was the societal norms in Jesus's times was a society that was standards that God had put in place for the Jewish people. 
And so it wasn't just that, well, he was in some wacko culture that had these standards, but this is where Jesus was. Um, it was God's chosen people that he had told them how to live. And so Jesus fit into that culture quite well, even though in some ways he stood out, like Patrick is saying, it's safe to assume that Jesus was dressed as were the scribes or the Pharisees because he was in the temple. Uh, so anyway, I'm not sure if you have anything sure. to say along those lines, but I find that to be one of the strongest arguments that's made toward um, disregarding any biblical standards on dress is, well, we just need to fit into the culture and society that we're in so that we can bring Jesus to them on their level, so to speak. Sure. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, that idea of being able to fit into, a, you know, whatever culture um, we're we're going into is the uh, when in Rome, so to speak. Right. When in Rome, do as the Romans. OK, so uh, that's not only wrong, it's stupid. Uh, it's not found anywhere in the Bible. So God's uh, word transcends culture. It transcends time. It transcends language. It transcends everything. OK, <clears throat> God's word is not ever for um, a specific group and not another group. Okay, <clears throat> the, it, God's word is just as applicable today as it was a hundred years ago, as it was a thousand years ago. Now, there are certain things that in the Bible, God gives us principles for instead of specifics. And the reason why is because things are changing. So we need to be able to apply the principle. Thou shalt not steal transcends time. God is for personal property. He's for property ownership. He's for private property. And it's not okay to deny someone their private property by taking it away from them. That transcends every culture that transcends all of time. So <clears throat> the idea is that God gives uh, women the command in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Okay. So women are supposed to dress modestly. Great. You can do that in every culture you go to. You don't have to dress like I do. You have to dress modestly. You don't have to dress like my wife does, ladies. You have to dress modestly. And you have to be able to go to the Bible and figure out what the standard is and make sure it's God's standard and then have at it. Okay. Oftentimes, people try to make up rules that are apart from Scripture, and I understand the desire to do that, and there are groups that might do that, okay? There are groups that have a dress code, and I have, I have friends uh, in the Mennonite church, and they have standards of dress that they require in some Mennonite churches, and if you want to belong to a church that does that, that's fine. And I'll be the first one to go on record and say, you know what? I appreciate your standards. I have never felt uncomfortable in the presence of a Mennonite man or woman who is a friend of mine or whom I have worked for in my entire life, ever. Okay, Their standard of dress has never offended me or made me uncomfortable or made my wife or my children uncomfortable. I cannot say that about every Christian I've been around. Okay, but there are groups that might have their own set of standards. That's fine. The thing is, I can't make up a standard that is apart from the Bible. But I don't think we've done that yet. We haven't even gotten into specifics. All we are saying is that, <clears throat> so, okay, so Caleb, you said something, and, and I don't want to miss this. So let me let me back up to this for one second. Whatever I feel comfortable with. Whatever I feel is modest. So that is really going back to my very first point, which is that you have a dress code by default. You, you don't have a dress code by design. You didn't put effort into figuring out what does God say is modest and then going in that direction. Instead, you let other people decide it for you. And you completely took the word of God and set it aside and said, I'm not using that to figure out my standard. I'm going to make up my own one. Okay, so now I want to challenge every Christian with another idea. Instead of saying whatever I feel comfortable with, I'm supposed to say as a Christian who, remember, I am supposed to give my life for you. I am supposed to give my life for the lost in the world. 
I am not supposed to say whatever I feel comfortable with. The challenge I am given is the high standard of whatever you feel comfortable with. Do you know that there are things in my life I don't do because I know it makes other people uncomfortable, other Christians? And I don't, I don't want to be the one that causes them to stumble. And the Bible talks about that in Romans 14, verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Anything. Now, I understand that chapter is talking about okay, uh, the dietary restrictions and the concerns the Jews had about eating meats offered to idols. And it, I understand what the chapter is about. But Paul adds to that. He says, eat flesh, drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth. Paul's idea is, as the Christian, it is my job to try to take the high road and make sure that the weaker brother is not offended by my actions and words that might cause him difficulty to be able to either come to Christ or grow closer to Christ. That is the high calling of the Christian. And I would tell every lady out there, you must remember, okay, women are candles amongst gunpowder. What you wear and the reason you wear it will cause problems with other people, especially men. My wife told me there is not one woman on earth who is okay with her husband admiring the body of another woman. There's not a woman on earth that is okay with that. But women still oftentimes will dress in a manner that does not go along with what we were talking about in 1 Timothy 2.9, purity, humility, moderation. Instead, they will dress in a manner that screams sex, pride, sensuality. That is not modest. That is trying to get attention from someone else in a way that the Bible forbids. And don't forget, ladies, you don't like it when other women dress that way and your husband is around them. And your husband doesn't like it. I don't feel comfortable when women dress in a manner like that, where they are trying to catch the attention and trying to catch the eye of every man that's around them. That is an immature and ridiculous way for women to dress. And there are far too many in Christianity that continue to do that. It is inappropriate and it is damaging. It is uncomfortable for everybody that is around. Now, what, what you just said there is so politically incorrect that it's not funny, which means nothing. I'm not saying politically political sure. correctness should have any bearing on what the Bible says. We're not here to express our opinion, simply repeating what God says in his word. But when you look at, at, at what you just mentioned there, oftentimes that can there, there are women that will take offense at the idea that that they need to be covered or protect because there are men out there prowling around and that when they expose themselves in a way that is suggestive um, and that is going to draw attention to them in a sexual way, that somehow that, that they're putting themselves at risk. And the fact is, is that men, men should not be out there preying on women. All right. The, the, the point isn't that, oh, well, it's your fault if you're not dressed properly that you get raped or that something bad happens to you. Um, that's that would be a, a foolish thing to say or to blame the, the victim in that in that way. But that's what oftentimes this whole argument gets turned on to. Oh, well, you're saying that women need to dress modestly to protect themselves. And so therefore you're blaming the victim, so to speak, when you have men that are really the the uh, aggressor here. But what I would like to say is is if, if you were to set all of the political correctness, all of the uh, women's uh, equality nonsense to the side and realize that as men and women both, we look at children as protectors of children and the way that the way that our children are. And if we were to see someone else exposing a child or or um, wanting to view a child's nakedness, that is it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not, it's not acceptable. We don't, nobody condones that. Everybody can look at that and say that that's evil. Children need to be protected. 
um, we can, as parents, we can look at it for our daughters. Patrick mentioned the idea that we can we can look at it as, as, as the women can look at it as as another man's wife trying to seduce your husband. You can you can relate to that as that would be an evil thing, or you would you would not appreciate that. Um, but oftentimes, as women, I hear this voice that, well, nobody can tell me how I'm going to dress. If I'm comfortable with it, everybody else needs to deal with it, and I can dress however I want. And um, don't don't throw this at me that I need to be protected or I need to cover myself up for my own safety. Um, look at it as a decent human being from the, the perspective of a child. You wouldn't want your child going around half naked, such that predators are going to be preying their eyes on them. And if you don't want your child doing that, why would you expect or be okay with yourself doing that because you're setting an example for your children as well. The fact that we've allowed this lunacy to overtake us to the fact to the point that we that we somehow think that political correctness needs to dictate the fact that we can't speak out on this issue to me is is a dangerous place that we've gotten to. And that's that's really what, what Patrick just just really hit the nail on the head with this whole thing is um, it doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter if you are a married woman or not another another woman's another woman is not going to appreciate her husband looking at you if you're half dressed you could be a young single girl it doesn't matter who you are and if another woman doesn't appreciate it um, you ought to have the decency to to take that into consideration but that usually doesn't most people don't care about that but if you do look at it in the way, in the way of children I, I know a lot of people that are half dressed themselves that their their jaw would hit the floor if they would see um, where a child was being exposed improperly or exposed to something of that nature. And so we can all be decent human beings when it comes to children, but when it comes to grownups, we think, well, we are mature, we're sac sexually active, so it's perfectly okay for us to expose ourselves in whatever way that we want. But as Christians, we're not supposed to be active in that. We're not supposed to be sexually active with other people we're not married to. That really is supposed to be saved for the for the, for the, the marriage bit. Um, so anyway, you can continue. I don't know if I took it off way off the tracks from where you wanted to go with it. No, you, you made some great points and I want to bring up one. Okay. And you made the point as far as, you know, uh, women dressing in a certain way and being treated inappropriately. And some people will, you know, uh, blame the victim. Okay. I want to make this clear. I'm one of those people. Okay. And I know how politically incorrect that is. And here, this is a direct quote from my wife, Caleb. How many times have you been around my wife over the years? Uh, I mean, at least a dozen or more times. Okay. Probably a couple so, <clears throat> sure. Okay. <clears throat> my wife said this verbatim. Okay. No man in my life has ever grabbed my ass. And it's because the way I dress, the way I act, and the places I do not go. And you want to know something, Caleb? I guarantee that your mother has never dealt with anything like that. Your mom has always dressed in a manner that I have always respected her for. Okay, And I guarantee that she has had men who look like they're probably ready to sell someone meth Okay, snap to and open the door for her because she looks like a lady and she carries herself like a lady who demands respect and she gets it. And every woman that dresses and acts like a lady, they receive the respect they're supposed to get. You catch <clears throat> the fish with the bait you use. And I'm telling you, there is a reason no dad wants their daughter dressing a certain way, acting a certain way, and going to certain places. Because then they know the way they're going to be treated. And we don't want that for our daughters. We want our daughters to be protected. We want our daughters to be safe. We don't want our, our daughters around a bad element. So guess what? One of the jobs of a father is to protect their daughter by teaching them these things, teaching them how to dress, teaching them how to act, teaching them how to carry themselves, teaching them the places they should not go. And I hate to tell you this, the Bible is full of that. Go to the Proverbs. The Proverbs all over the place. Don't go to this place. Don't go to that place. Only bad people go to this place. The Bible says that over and over and over again. All the time. 
There's a reason for it. And we need to start listening to the Bible. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with that, but also clarify one thing that you just mentioned. And I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, 100%, do. I 100% I hundred percent agree with, with what you're saying in that, um, especially, I mean, some of the places you're talking, you didn't, you didn't specify any places, but I'm, if you, if you're a, a young woman and you go to a bar, you dress down for the occasion and, and then everybody you're dealing is with drunken guys, guess what's going to yeah, happen? It's a bad mix and people get molested mix. and it's yes. So there it, it is. Okay. That is exactly what you're asking for. Yeah. When you when you go to a place like that, and what Patrick mentioned is, um, which I still stand by what I said earlier that we shouldn't be blaming the victim in this case when there's a, when there's a bad actor. Men are responsible for their actions. Just because you've put yourself sure. out there as a fish on the market, so to speak, doesn't mean that the guy was justified in acting on that. But you you definitely Obviously. you definitely put yourself in a vulnerable position by putting yourself out there and flaunting your, your body in a, such a way that that it attracts that type of a look. But um, and thank God that your wife has never been touched inappropriately. Um, and you are absolutely correct about my mother. But I will say that I do know people. I have several sisters, well, seven sisters that um, I grew up with uh, from my parents' marriage uh, together, and they were always dressed. Uh, we, we didn't dress up to go to church. They were always dressed carefully, modestly. I have witnessed several occasions where either my sisters um, or my mother or other godly women that I knew that were dressed very modestly, very carefully, and that there was men that came onto them inappropriately. Um, and um, I have known people that um, were, you, you mentioned Mennonites, there was a, a Mennonite girl that was raped and murdered recently. Um, so there are, and it is going to be the odd occasion where this happens, but there are evil men out there that are going to prey on godly men or women, no matter how well we're dressed, but it's sure. not as, it is not as often. And kind of the, the standard is that you're probably setting yourself up to be a lot more likely to be preyed on by, um, you know, by, by a predator, when you put yourself out there and expose yourself in a way that you shouldn't be exposed. Yeah. Can we say the exception makes the rule? Yeah, exactly. Okay. You know, and obviously for, for those of you with an IQ smaller than my shoe size, nobody is saying that the aggressor is, <laughs> is innocent. That's right. not the point. Okay. Um, the point is we can do our part to not get ourselves in trouble. Okay. Someone once told me, uh, you know, you don't go to a whorehouse to listen to the piano. Okay. You don't go to a barbershop to read the newspaper because you hang out at a barbershop long enough. All of a sudden, guess what? A haircut's going to sound pretty good. Okay. So, you know, right. see if you can draw something from that. Okay. So I don't know how many specifics you want to get into, but we do have... Um, well, we had a couple of comments that I thought we should get to. I'm not sure if that's what you're going for, but um, somebody had asked, um, I guess this was the lady that had requested the topic. Uh -huh. She asked, um, is, uh, as a Christian woman, where did, where did she say it? Can she wear pants? Um, okay. Uh, does it mean as a woman that I cannot wear pants? And um, then she went on to ask if this is uh, talking about cross-dressers. I believe she's talking about where the Bible talks about men dressing like women, women dressing like men. The, the Bible mm -hmm. never mentions pants. Pants were not really a thing that was being worn by women in the Bible. Um, like Patrick mentioned, there was probably some undergarments. I'm not really sure what they looked like. I wasn't around back then. Um, pants were not something that were were worn as far as I can, can tell that was not something that was being worn in, in the times of the Bible. It's not something that's prescribed in the Bible. It is something that's very common. And I don't know that, that I'm really comfortable going into and going on the record saying one way or the other, that the Bible says something about this. This is kind of like, what does the Bible say about the internet? Well, the internet wasn't around back then. People weren't really wearing, um, wearing the same clothes then that they were, that they are now, but there are, um, there are clothes that are, quite obviously appropriate and clothes that are not appropriate. Um, if you're going to church and you are going into the house of God, which the reason that I keep bringing this back to how we, how it's appropriate to dress in church is because the witness that we are in the community around us should be consistent with 
with what we are in the presence of God, I believe. People should see us and there should be some consistency in the, in the way that we dress, going to church and the way that we're out and about. So continue to to realize that when you walk out of church and you you throw your, your church clothes off and you put on some skimpy clothes and you expect to be a good witness to the world, that's not going to be an effective strategy. But there are, um, to be modest does mean to be appropriate. That is one of the definitions of modesty of the, of the Greek word that was being used there is to be appropriate and um, and to be respectful. So I don't see how that it is appropriate or respectful for men or women to be wearing tight, revealing clothes. I mean, I don't understand why where we've come to, and I think a lot of people can, can see this as an extreme, but people, uh, women that are wearing these leggings, I mean, you might, to me, once you get to the point of it being like body paint, where you're, skin you tight are. Spandex, just go ahead yeah. and say it. The skin Pouring tight into, spandex, you know, tight black yoga pants. What is and, wrong with you? And th that, what I is have wrong seen with that, you? How on I earth have, did that become the standard? Are you kidding me? That is I have, insane. You I have seen that in church. You catch my daughter wearing those. Oh, my soul. How is that the standard in society now? Do you know that I've had men who are not saved, friends of mine, who have told me, this is ridiculous. It makes me so uncomfortable that every woman is wearing these all of a sudden. We just turn around and they're wearing these skin-tight pants. Are you kidding me? Is that... Is that strong enough? Is that clear, everybody? It's ridiculous. That is not modest. If that is modest, please explain what the step of immodesty is. Where well, do you go from there? And and the thing is, is when you see women wearing booty shorts all the time, then when they go from yeah. that to wearing skin tight pants, sure. it may almost for the, to them it may seem somewhat modest. But yeah, the, the, That's the how reality they go to is and funerals. Exactly. Well, and I have seen plenty of them um, on the move in church trying to worship God. And and sure. all you can do is try to figure out how you're going to make your your escape or get to a point in the building where you're not where this person isn't standing in front of you, because sure. it is extremely distracting yeah. to have somebody that is, you know, basically painted on jeans or painted it's on ridiculous. yoga pants, whatever they are. So yeah. that's kind of the extreme. But but when pants, when women started first wearing pants, Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not the extreme, Caleb. That's okay, the norm I'm, today. Okay, well, I'm talking about as far as pants go, that would be the, kind of the extreme of pants. But uh -huh. pants, pants. Uh, I'm sure that there's some people that can feel very modest in pants when they take off their yoga pants mm -hmm. and put on their jeans. Sure. But the idea that we go off of modesty again, based off of how 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 comfortable we are relative to how immodest somebody else is. Sure. Um, when the Bible talked about uh, women dressing modestly and the, the clothes that they were wearing, it was, it was referring to long flowing robes. And I know this isn't a, you know, it isn't a showy thing to do. It's not a popular thing to do. You, you're not going to look as cute. You think when you go to church wearing, you know, a dress that goes down close to the floor and actually covers most of your body up. But the reality of it is, is that when, the, when there's people that are dressed in something that that covers you up in one way or another. And I'm not going to say that that has to be a dress for women. Um, there may be some exception to that, but there are, there are clear, there, there is something clearly that's different about women wearing dresses. And that's what they used to wear a hundred years ago when women started wearing pants, it was it, a lot of people's jaws hit the floor because it was considered to be extremely immodest. Now we're looking at yoga pants. We're saying, wow, this is immodest, but um, I don't I don't think that we should just because it's popular for women to wear pants that we should assume that it is biblically acceptable. That's what I'll say on pants. OK, so now I have to answer that one. But before I do, let me let me make the let me add to the comment Caleb just made about ladies uh, modesty. When you when you dress modestly, you might not feel as cute as you did before. And and that's true. OK, and, and I understand uh, I understand that. And we're not saying that uh, women can't, you know, be uh, beautiful and attractive when they dress modestly because they can. Exactly. That's, you know, we, we, we've all seen many women that do that. OK, but here's the thing. OK, you want to dress cute. You want to dress sexy. Do it for your husband. That's where you do it. 
He's the one that your body is for. Okay? Get whatever you want. Get on the internet and buy some sexy stuff. Go out to the mall and buy some sexy stuff and wear it for your husband. Not for everyone in public. That's the whole idea. One man for one woman. It is, it is good and natural and beautiful and wonderful within the confines of marriage. That is the way it's supposed to work. But in the rest of the world, put on some clothes. Okay, so if I haven't made everyone mad yet, I'm going to do it now. I don't care. <clears throat> Okay, I take a hard line on this. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. It says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord. Okay, so the question came up. I'm going to say it. Yes, women are supposed to wear dresses. Women are not supposed to wear pants. Now, did pants exist back in Jesus' time? No, and they did sure didn't exist back in Moses' time. And I understand that. But the Bible transcends time and culture. Okay? <clears throat> and this is what I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> the Bible clearly says there is a difference between man's clothes and women's clothes. It says that. It cannot be any more clear about that. So you have to draw a line somewhere and say it is not okay for men to wear these and it is not okay for women to wear these. And this is the crazy part. <clears throat> Kayla brought up the point in time at which a woman started to wear pants in public. Because guess what? There was a time when that never happened in this country, ever. I was talking to a friend of mine I went to church with. He's in his late 80s, and we were talking about this subject, and this verse came up, and I asked him. The fellow's name was John. I said, John, do you remember the first time you saw a woman wear pants? And he stopped, and his eyes got real big, and he said, I did. I was about 12 or 13 years old, and he said, Patrick, I could not believe it. I could not believe it. It was such a shock that I could not believe it. I said, okay, John. I, I, I believe you. It was that crazy back then. Well, guess where we are now? Because I can ask everyone <clears throat> watching this video right now, do you remember the first time you saw a man in a dress? Because every single one of you out there has seen a man wearing a skirt or a dress. You remember how disgusting it was? You remember how appalling it was? That was the way everyone felt way back when. Now, I don't care if you like that or not. <clears throat> I'm just telling, I'm just stating the facts. I for now, one, have actually not seen that. So yeah. I don't well, know if I'm just Caleb, lucky. But. Drive some more Uber up in Austin. You'll see it. Okay. Get out of Rosebud with a population of 400 people and go to Austin and you'll see a whole bunch of Fruit Loops wearing dresses. But here's where I'm at. If everyone wants to say that the standard is there's no difference between clothes for men and women, okay, which is ridiculous, then that means you have to be okay with men wearing dresses. Right. And that's the logical conclusion you get to. So if you want to sit there, that's fine. I'm not going to say it. And I'm going to go another step further, okay, because I'm getting loud, which means I'm passionate about this and I'm rolling. So here you go. You want to know what God says about Deuteronomy 22.5? What does he say? What type of a sin is that? He calls it an abomination. Do you know how often God uses that term? God says a man wearing women's clothes or a woman wearing man's clothes is an abomination. That is the same word he uses for homosexuality and every other sexually licentious sin. He uses that for rape. He uses that for the worst sins. And nobody wants to associate the second half of that verse with the first half. Everyone wants to just say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, they shouldn't do it, but whatever. That's kind of the way the culture goes. That is not the case. God says it's an abomination and we won't even take it seriously. We won't even consider what that verse says. What does that verse mean? Where is the line? Show me what the line is. It is insane to me that Christians can read over that verse and skip over it and be like, oh, well, it's just an abomination. Great, fellas. Get your dresses out. My sons will never wear a dress. And you want to know something? Everyone in Christianity right now will say, amen, brother. Don't ever let your sons wear a dress, right? We're all for that. That makes sense. But for some reason, we have gone so far 
from what the standard used to be that we're at a point where it's like, oh, come on, you can't be that old fashioned and honestly have the belief that women should wear dresses. Yeah, I am. I absolutely am. And I'll go you another one. You want to know the first group that was wearing pants as far as women goes in society, Caleb? Go ahead. Guess what group of women started wearing pants first? Prostitutes. Really? There it is. Go find another podcast to listen to because I'm so mean. <laughs> well, you, I think you addressed her other question, and that is, is this referring just to cross-dressing? And obviously, you've, you've touched on, I guess, that would be kind of the extreme of cross-dressing, but I think it definitely goes before you become a drag queen um, or, or get to that point where that's a, a lifestyle or, or put on. There are people that are running around, you know, men with long hair, women with short hair, um, yeah. men wearing women's clothes, women wearing men's clothes. And this is the kind of this is the kind of behavior that leads to the sexual immorality that we're seeing break out in this country where pretty soon now we don't have men and women. No standards, just high. no differences. Why not yeah. just men with men and women with women? And, and and let me let me let me go another one in case any of you ladies are still here, you know, on the podcast listening to me. Okay. <clears throat> I, I have gone to conservative churches where I mean every woman is wearing a dress, and that's it. You don't see anything about that. I am in a church right now that is much more liberal, and I, I, I don't think there's many women, you know, that wear dresses exclusively other than my wife. My wife is the only woman that I know that literally does not own a single pair of pants. <clears throat> that doesn't change the way I feel about any of these women. Every single woman has to read the Bible and come to a conclusion on their own as to what they feel comfortable with concerning God. And you should not take my rant, you know, to make a decision. You should search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. And I love all of you, no matter what you wear. But some of what you wear makes it very uncomfortable to try to be a Christian man and be successful with my walk with God. And more than anything, that is my hope and desire. And for any young ladies that might listen to this, please understand you are candles amongst gunpowder. It is so important that you get your standards from the word of God. I know how difficult it is. I know how awkward and strange and weird you feel trying to dress modestly in a world where every single teenage girl out there, every college aged girl out there, every single girl out there is trying so hard to show off their body to get some level of attention from the men around them. And you are reading the Bible and you feel convicted and you love God and you want to do the will of God. I so admire the fight that you are putting up. It, I understand how difficult it is right now because the America today is so sexually licentious. It is appalling. And there are Christian men all over this country that are so glad that you make an effort to dress modestly and help us to not stumble. Every woman around you appreciates it. I am telling you, I know it is difficult. Okay, but your Lord and Savior loves you and is so glad that you are trying to obey him. That's all wow. I got. Well said. Um, and so I, I wanted to mention something, and this is obviously we've tried to keep this mostly about uh, what does the Bible say about this, but there is also the practical side of this. And Patrick just mentioned some of his experience there with that. And um, obviously my opinion or Patrick's opinion doesn't matter on this, but I, I'm just going to give you a piece of my mind as well. And that is um, I, I am in a church where uh, it is the norm for the women to wear dresses, not only at church, but the rest of the week as well. Um, I think most of the women at our church probably don't own a pair of pants or if they do, it's, you know, for going swimming or something like that. Um, and so there is, there is the practical side of what it's like to be surrounded by people that honor God in this way. And I have, um, from, a, from an early age, I grew up in a home where my parents put out an effort for godliness in the home. And my mom did dress modestly. My sisters dressed modestly. And that was something that I found that as a young man growing up in a home like that, 
that I learned to love and appreciate women that had that were that that had some some sort of value on themselves. And I look at women now and I see some women that are that are dressing such that they're putting themselves out there. And it, it breaks my heart to think with so much little value on themselves, on their body, that they would be willing to put it out there, out there to the public in the way that they do. I've always felt that it's easier to see the inner beauty of a woman when you're not distracted by her showing off what shouldn't, what is not yours to look at. And I'm just going to give you a little example of how this plays out in the church in a practical way. So we have a ministry here in our church and we work every week, um, quite a bit of time together as a church, the men, the women, we all, we all function together and we don't actually have a, a church uniform. It's not like Patrick mentioned where it's, where, uh, some of the Mennonite churches where everybody has the same kind of dress. Um, and there are people in our church that dress more carefully than others. Um, and I will say that not every dress, just because you put on a dress doesn't mean that that dress is modest. There are some dresses that are not modest as well. But the women in the church wearing dresses and covering themselves up such that when we go to work together as a team and we are feeding the community or we're making a meal to serve uh, or we have a fellowship meal or whatever, and you sit down as couples and you're, and you're visiting with people and you're able to laugh and, and worship together and have a good time and your focus can stay on God. It can stay, you can, you can keep your eyes on Jesus. You can keep your focus on what you're supposed to be up to. And it's not this constant battle of being distracted by things that you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be setting your eyes on. It makes it for me. And I have been in churches where the women were not dressing appropriately. And I'm just going to say uh, for, for, for women in the church, if you want strong men, if you want strong men as your sons, if you want strong men to grow, to grow up in your church and to appreciate women for their inner beauty and not to go out and look for the, the hottest, most attractive uh, female that's willing to flaunt herself at him. If that's what you want for your son, set that example by you yourself dressing well. And for men, Patrick mentioned that there is a standard for men as well with, you know, whether it was beards in the Bible or men uh, wearing appropriate clothing to go as well. I think that out of respect for our wives and I appreciate my wife, the convictions that she has, that she does choose to wear a dress and she chooses to dress um, as modestly as, as she feels that she can. And that she tries to set that example for our daughters. Um, and, and Patrick and I aren't going to link a uh, link here to little house on the prairie costumes. We're not advocating that everybody has to be wearing 1960s. You know, there's ways that you can still feel good about yourself and where there's cute dresses out there that, that girls enjoy. I mean, my wife, I think has fun dressing. It's not like she's just always, you know, doing this out of shame or something, trying to cover herself up because she doesn't think she's worth anything. I appreciate the fact that she values herself enough that she doesn't degrade herself in that way. And um, I have, I've always appreciated that about her. That was part of what attracted me to my wife was the fact that I felt that she had some self-respect and it makes it to me way easier to respect my wife. When I see that my wife respects her body, it makes it easier for me to respect the other women that I interact with in the church. When I see that they respect their body, they're not putting themselves out there in a way that that I am afraid that their husband is going to catch me glancing at, at, the, at their wife because she's half dressed in church. You know, <clears throat> it takes that away and you're actually able to get to work in the kingdom of God and quit flaunting your flesh to the point that you are distracting from God. So that is, that is my, uh, my thought with it is men should also be careful with the way that we dress. Um, mm -hmm. There are men that I know, you know, are very, very vain with the way that they dress as well. And we should be aware of that. It's, and it's, it's a little different for us to try to stand out because men are not as attractive and, um, and whatever as women are. Apparently, women seem to be drawn to men touching them or caring about them and that type of thing. More men are attracted to looking at women. So the modesty in men and women is different. But there are ways that men can flaunt themselves. And, and I think that we should be aware of that and not be you know showing up to church in muscle shirts and trying to impress the ladies and, and that type of thing. <laughs> So anyways, that's, I guess, that's my little rant as far as my experience with it, the way that I grew up learning to respect and appreciate women that respected them, themselves. That's the way that I look at it. I, I feel that if you don't have enough self-respect to dress, to dress yourself, how can you expect anybody else to respect you? <clears throat> you know, Caleb, you made a, a good point that I want to, I want to, uh, 
uh, mention here. And I know we're past time, but that's fine because we're honestly never getting back to this subject ever again, as far as I'm concerned. So we might as well get it all out on the table now. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of you don't know, C Caleb and I have both had our wife, uh, our wives on this um, podcast with us. Um, so you, you've all got to see our wives and, and, and Caleb's wife is, is a beautiful woman. And <clears throat> I have always appreciated the way she dresses. I have never felt uncomfortable knowing Caleb and his wife are coming over to my house. I cannot say that about every friend that I have. I have friends, Christian and non-Christian, where it is difficult to want to spend time with them because I know the way that they dress, the way that their daughters dress, it is uncomfortable to be around that. I don't, I don't like that. And that's not, <clears throat> it's easily remedied. It's easily remedied. Um, with that being said, let's talk about modest apparel for men for a minute. Okay. So, and, there's a lot less talked about in the Bible concerning men other than they are to be covered. So I'm just going to go over some of my personal standards. Um, and Caleb, I, I'd like to hear, you know, what you think and, and what you might have. So <clears throat> for me, I have never felt uh, comfortable with, uh oh, something just happened. There was an echo. Oh, no. OK, it's, it's cleared up. I <clears throat> So for me, I have never felt comfortable with the idea of, you know, men uh, having their shirts off. Um, I always thought that that was really? a standard. <laughs> you don't, you I don't show up to church without your shirt on? <laughs> no, but further than that, I don't show up anywhere without my shirt on. Okay. When I go to a friend's house for a pool party to go swimming, I wear a shirt when I get in the pool. Because I don't think it's appropriate. I don't like taking my clothes off in public around a bunch of other people. And they make shirts for that. I don't wear a cotton shirt. I wear a shirt that is, I don't even know what it's made out of, but it's its something that's a lot like a bathing suit material that doesn't absorb, you know, the water. It's very lightweight, something you might play sports in. And I always wear those because I think it's inappropriate. I don't feel comfortable with it. So, you know, I don't do that. If you guys saw me, when I go to work, okay, I own my own business. I get to decide what the uniform is. And when I go to work, I wear long pants. I wear boots. I wear a collared shirt. It's a short sleeve shirt. Okay. But I don't even wear, you're not even going to find me uh, really in shorts. Okay? And, and I'm not going to tell you that that has to be your standard. What I'm going to tell you is that I know that nobody has ever been uncomfortable or offended because of my attire. I've actually had people tell me that where they said, gonna, I appreciate the way you dress. Hop off. Uh -oh. I'm going to hop off here for just a second um, so I can meet somebody. One of my friends just showed up. So continue on this. I'll be right back. So I might not be going for that much longer, but I'll, I'll no, it's, it's just, just one minute. I'll be right back. Okay. 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 Sounds good. <clears throat> so fellas, you need to have a standard for dress as well. Now I'm, if anything, again, it's the same idea. You have to ha make your standard based on the word of God. Okay, find out what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. The idea of dressing modestly goes for men just as well as women. Okay, <clears throat> understand that when you read about the differences between men and women, it's not as if only the women have to follow those commandments and only the men have to follow theirs. Okay. The Bible uh, talks about in Ephesians that a husband has to love his wife. Now, wives have to love their husbands also. Hold on. Caleb's. There we go. Sorry, Caleb's microphone and headset was just going crazy there, so I had to mute it. So as I was saying, even though the man is specifically given that commandment to love his wife, that doesn't mean women don't have to love their husbands. What it say, what the, the reason it gave the husbands that command to love their wives is because husbands struggle with that. 
So it gave the, the, the husband the command that you need to love your wife. You need to make sure that you're doing this. In the same way, God gives the woman the specific command about dressing modestly because God knows women. Why? Because he created you. He made you a certain way on purpose. And he knows that women struggle with that because they enjoy or appreciate the attention. And you can take that to a point where instead of a man being able to appreciate the beauty of a woman without sinning, simply because she is dressed modestly and classy and she's attractive, instead they can go over that line where they are trying to uh, attract the gaze of men. So God gave the commandment to women. That doesn't mean that men do not have to dress modestly. Yes, men do as well, but it is women who struggle with that usually more than men. So for the man, when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're at church, when you're out in public, we still have to have a level of modesty that other Christians can feel comfortable around. Okay, and that has to be determined by the word of God. That's what I wanted to add, Caleb. Yeah, I just so, didn't want the men to get off the hook. Okay. I, I missed a little bit of what you said, but I heard most of it. But yeah, I think <laughs> I think that um, one last thing that I thought of when, when you started mentioning as far as your your comfort level. Um, I, I 100% agree. I don't think that it is appropriate or respectful. All right. Even if, even if you don't feel that it's immodest for you to go around without a shirt on, for instance, or in a wife beater shirt. I mean, I think they look terrible myself, <laughs> muscle shirts, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, if you are going to expect women to have enough respect for themselves out of respect for women, let's not be going around topless and expect our wives not to do the same. All right. Sure. I realize that's different. I realize we're not as cute as they are, whatever, but it's, it, there is, there's reasons why that, um, and then God had standards in the Bible for men not to expose their nakedness going up onto the altar. There was a standard of modesty for both men and for women. And I do think that that men shouldn't expect women to dress right and then men be able to just throw it to the wind, whether you're on the job site or whatever it is, you know, taking your shirt off. That's very, that's normal. That's normal for men. That's just as normal for us to be on here talking about that as it is for us to be talking about, you know, women wearing pants. Um, and I, I just... Um, you mentioned even swimming. And this is something that I find that there is oftentimes Christians that dress pretty well most of the time, but in certain sports Until and different they activities. they go to the beach. <laughs> and then it is like, man. All bets are off, baby. And there is ways, don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that you cannot swim without, I'm not saying that you have to go Sw swimming in a burka. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm saying there are ways to still, you know, we were just this last weekend, we were at a uh, water park with some friends from church and, and the ladies that were there were, you know, still wearing shirts and, and covered up and, and you can, you can still have fun. You don't have to be stuck up weird, you know, Christians that can't have fun. Um, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you need to be flaunting yourselves in a way, in, in the way that uh, would, would cause other people to stumble. So I think it's, it is important to have some consistency in it. There is different applications where maybe you are going to wear different clothes to go swimming or, or jogging or, you know, different things that you do, but you can still be decent in doing so. You don't yeah. have to throw caution to the wind. So. You know, Caleb, I had uh, one friend of mine who was actually a youth pastor at, at a rather large church before he went off and started his own church. And uh, they had a very nice home. Uh, it was down in New Mexico. So it was, it was quite a bit warmer, kind of like Texas. And uh, they had a really nice big house, real nice big landscaping, and they had a big in the ground pool. And they would oftentimes have youth activities uh, where everyone would go swimming. And one of the things they would do is <clears throat> um, all of uh, him and all of the fellas would uh, go into the living room and they would have a devotional time and a little Bible study and his wife and all the girls would go swimming. And then they would do that for half an hour and then the girls would get out and they would um, go and they would do their devotional time and all the fellows would go and, and jump in the pool and, and get to play a little bit and do a little bit of swimming. And, and, and the point is, even with 
you know, the, the efforts that they could make, you know, they would struggle with, you know, um, sometimes the, the kids wouldn't really hold to the standards they were hoping for. So they wanted to make it easy on the kids to not have to deal with the awkward situation and the possible sexual tension that can come up, you know, certainly, especially with youth, but, you know, with any age. So they just said, okay, we're, you know, we're just going to separate it. And that's fine. Everyone has fun. They get to go swimming. No one feels uncomfortable. And, you know, so just like you said, God's not trying to tell you that you can't have fun. You know, that's not the case at all. Uh, if you try, if you, if your goal and your standard is the word of God and the standard that we find in the word of God, as far as what I can wear and, and how I can be modest, uh, then guess what? You're going to figure out a way to do everything that you want to do. And you're going to do it in a way where God says it's acceptable. And if there's an activity, if there's an event where I find I cannot do it up to the standard, I believe God has for me. Well, guess what? I don't do it. That's right. okay. I'm not missing out on anything. Okay. There, there's a million things that I get to enjoy in the world. And the same with my wife and my daughter and all my kids. And, and when we hit something where it's like, you know what, we just don't feel like there's a way we can do this and be appropriate. That's fine. Then we're not going to do it because it's more important to us that we're going to obey God, you know, than we're going to have fun for one hour at some activity. That's not that important to us. Right. Okay. We're, we just hit an hour and a half. Yeah. Man. Well, uh, somebody says that it's the best conversation that they've ever heard on this topic, which obviously means you've never heard anybody talk much about this topic. <laughs> because well, that's a friend of mine who's actually a pastor out in California. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, it, it, it does good to talk about these topics. And I wanted to mention one thing on this, and this is something I enjoy about this podcast, and that is that we don't have to have um, our, our goal on this podcast is not and never has been to get on here and convince anybody of anything. It is simply Amen. to point back to the word of God. And the, the cool thing about that is it's not like you're going to church and there has to be the, the aha moment at the end where the pastor yeah. somehow ties everything together and everybody comes to Jesus at the end. Um, Patrick and I both feel that some of these are conversations that need to be had, even though um, we may not have the answer um, mm -hmm. for you. And there's questions that haven't been asked on this. We haven't addressed certain certain aspects of dress. But I think and trust that as Christians, as we as we turn to God's word and as we uh, pray and seek him and seek the Holy Spirit's guidance in our life, that he does convict us and we change. And, and I think the the point isn't just to be the weirdest people on earth. But mm -hmm. the Bible says um, that we are not our own. We've been bought with a, a price and therefore we should glorify Christ in our bodies. And this is something that is a lot easier to do when you're dressed appropriately. Um, and it's easier for, for the rest of us that are trying to do that, not to stumble into sin by having somebody walk past that is, you know, half dressed. So um, yeah. I think that mu much of this really is going to, like Patrick said, don't take our word for it. <clears throat> Go to the word of God and, and seek him out. And if you disagree with us, that's, that's right. We're probably wrong on this. Go ahead, disagree, but go to the Bible, and yep. hopefully you don't find yourself disagreeing with the Bible. Yeah, um, Caleb, you hit the nail on the head. You know, everyone needs to remember that you are going to stand before Christ for yourself, okay? You're, yep. We're not going to go to Christ on your behalf and have to answer for you and your decisions. You're going to have to stand up, uh, you know, for your own decisions. So just make sure that you have a reason for them, and you feel like you can tell God, God, I did this because the Bible says this, and this is what I feel like you wanted. That's that's the whole idea. Nobody has to believe what Caleb believes or what I believe. Okay, uh, that that's not our goal. Our goal is to pick topics that you don't often hear discussed and uh, talk about them, get a bunch of Bible out there for you. You can go home and do your own homework and come to your own conclusion. And that's what we encourage folks to do. And if we're lucky, Caleb will stoke a fire under me and I'll throw it fit like a child. And that's always amusing for everybody. Um, I did want to show you, okay, this is a book uh, that you can all take a look at. It is a helpful book if you're curious about the subject. There are several books out there. This one is that thick, so it's only like uh, 75 pages. So if you want a place to start, uh, Christian Modesty and the Public, Public Undressing of America by Jeff Pollard, you can find that, and that'll be 
you know, one thing you can put in your library and at least you'll have a whole bunch of verses to kind of uh, go through and, and help you get started there. I appreciate you all sticking with us for this long. I can't believe we have anyone watching us after an hour and a half. So with that, um, that's all I had. Caleb, any last words or can we say nope, goodbye? I think, I think that's good. Thank you guys for joining us and share the video if you know anybody that uh, you think <laughs> needs to get called out or, or suggest it. This may be a good way to start the conversation and uh, give us a few more followers. So. That's, yeah, yeah, I'm sure this video will give us a bunch more followers. <laughs> I've been watching our numbers. <laughs> no, actually, I think, going. I think we're at about 1,100. <laughs> All right, so with that, good night, everyone. We'll see you next week. I don't even know what we're talking about, but um, oh, actually, I do. I think we're talking about the rapture and the end times, so that'll be an oh, exciting cool. one. That was something else someone suggested. So everyone, enjoy your weekend. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.